name is Todd Labrador. I will talk about canoe building, birch bark canoe building. So what's the target age group with your program that you're, you work with? Because of what I do is so rare, I, I really didn't put an age on it. We like to have youth, but uh, canoe building requires, you know, skills that maybe some youth are not, they don't have yet. So if an elder wants to join in, I, I accept them as well. So it can be from, uh, maybe let's say from 16 years and up. Is there like a name for the program that you... No, it's mostly just myself. It's Todd Labrador and um, I have a page on Facebook that I, it's called uh, Water Dancers Mi'kmaq Arts. I do many things besides canoe building, but canoe building is really the one that I've put a lot of focus on. So it's just a Mi'kmaq birch bark canoe building. So what uh, what do you think makes your program or your workshop stand out? I think because it's mostly one of a kind. Over the years, I've, I've been told that I'm the only practicing Mi'kmaq birch bark canoe builder. So being the only one who does this on a yearly basis, I've, I've done courses all over, and I tend to get booked two and three years ahead. So it's it's very rare, and uh, and we don't have uh, Mi'kmaq birch bark canoe builders building canoes every year. Sometimes they'll build one or two, but I build them every year for the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years. What impact do you see on the people who take the workshops from being involved? Well, there's so much uh, because we go harvesting. So it's to identify the trees, the roots, and the, and the wood. We build canoe. So we may start, uh, you know, with the harvesting, but also they, some of them have to learn how to use hand tools like crooked knives, draw knives. Um, so some of them will start with no experience at all my my courses sometimes will run for six weeks and and in the end we end up with a, a functional birch bark canoe and uh so they they many people will take many different things away from my courses they'll take uh some will, will learn how to use a knife for the first time some will learn how to sew with spruce root uh, so so there's many things but the key thing for me is to introduce very valuable tradition back to our Mi'kmaq nation and also to the world because I build mostly in public. So I may train people, but the public is also encouraged to watch and in some cases participate. Do you see a change in the, in the students over time? Yeah, most of the time they'll come in with, um, they're very shy and they don't have a lot of the skills that are required. And when they leave and look at what they have worked as a team to create, they're really proud of what they did. Some of them are shy and they, and they, they don't speak well in public. But as they're working, uh, they develop more confidence and are able to share their, their knowledge of what they've learned with people, whether it's uh, indigenous people or youth or visitors from all over the world. So I really see uh, a positive change. I've always said it, it benefits the uh, Mi'kmaq community, the Mi'kmaq nation. It benefits our, the province, but it benefits the country and also the world because we have people coming from all over the world to watch or to take part in these workshops. So you have people of all ages learning together at the same time? Yeah, sometimes I'll only work with a few at a time because uh, uh, I don't have enough skilled helpers. So uh, I'll take two or three at a time. And then sometimes during the project we'll have time where people can sign up and come work with me for a couple hours. and maybe do some work on the canoe. So it, I've had people from 
ages of probably five years old to probably 80 years old. And sometimes it's only for a few hours. Sometimes it's for, you know, a longer period of time. But uh, because it's such a rare opportunity, it, it goes over very well. Is there a language component to the program? Mostly just English, but uh, I mean, you know, I work with, uh, mostly my, my goal is to work with the First Nations youth, uh, the Mi'kmaq youth, to, to revive this almost lost tradition. And my great-grandfather was the last builder in our family. Uh, after he died, it's, it almost became lost. And uh, so I have people from uh, Mi'kmaq communities in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island. I have people, indigenous people as well, from all over the country and all over North America. But I also have Germans, uh, people from France, uh, you know, people from all over that that come to uh, watch and sometimes take part. What to you tells you that your program is working? The fact that I'm booked three years ahead. I could probably be booked longer, and and I can only build so many. Last summer, I built three canoes, two in Nova Scotia and one in Prince Edward Island. And I'm booked right now from 2019, 2020, and 2021. Uh, so, you know, I the fact that I get so many calls. Last summer, I had 20 requests, and I can only take, I only took two. And it's more than I can handle, so it's it's definitely a need there. But over the years, I've gone into schools. I've done various uh, programs with, with youth in schools. I went to teachers' college and studied to be a techno a tech edge tech ed teacher. I'm a licensed carpenter as well, and 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 also a, an artist. Could you talk a bit more about what happens in your program? Like, what are the stages of the of it? Sure, it's a, mostly it's a, it's a six week course, and what I do with these types of courses is that I will set it up so that most of the roots are harvested, the birch bark is harvested, a lot of the woodworking is done, and what we do over the period of six weeks is we put everything together from the frame of the canoe to the ribs, to the birch bark. We sew everything together. And, but during that time, we'll, we will go into the forest and we will actually harvest birch bark and we will actually harvest spruce roots and we'll uh, boil the roots and take the bark off. We will s split the roots. Like splitting roots is a skill that's developed over lots of time. A lot of these things you can't learn in a day or a week. Not many people can take a six-week course and then go home and build a canoe. It's a long-term apprenticeship where sometimes you have to work and develop that skill. It's, it's a skill that you can learn how to build a canoe, but out of that you'll have other skills that develop, like how to make birch bark containers, how to, how to uh, make other things with spruce root, uh, how to bend wood, like how to bend wood, how to identify wood. There's many different things that, uh, many spin-offs, I guess, from, from the project. But also for them to know that this is what their ancestors did with very limited tools. Uh, they had stone, bone, and wood. And they created canoes, you know, traveled the ocean and, and across the lakes. What would you say is the aim of the program, aside from making a canoe? Like, is there maybe a healing aspect or spiritual component or aim? It is. It's a, It's very spiritual. Harvesting is spiritual because we, we we do ceremonies where we offer we offer tobacco. We do smudging to harvest the canoe, uh, harvest the bark and the roots. We ask our ancestors to to help guide us. So it's a healing process. It's and we've always, my father always said, it's a healing process of as you're building. It's a very uh, spiritual, meditating in a lot of ways too. But also it, it, it instills a sense of pride back to our people because the, the youth come along and they and they start to develop skills that they didn't have. 
So that makes them proud. But the elders start coming out and saying, I remember when I was a child and my great grandfather made baskets. Or my, so out of that, stories come back. Maybe stories that were almost forgotten until the elders saw spruce roots. Then they start telling stories of when they were little collecting spruce roots with their grandparents. So it's a healing process, but it's also bringing positive things to the communities where the elders love it because they, they travel for hours to come and just to be with us for a few hours. And uh, because they are so uh, pleased at what we're doing. Have you found any challenges that you've had to overcome in running the program? Yes, there's many challenges. For for me, I always said building birch bark canoes because I didn't really have a teacher. It was like taking the road less traveled because the road I took, people traveled it. But when I traveled it, it had been all grown up because it had been almost lost and and the path that was created by my ancestors had not been traveled for a long time. So I had to clear that path again. And to understand today that not every birch tree works, only a certain tree works. So I have to find a certain tree, but today all I find is clear cuts. Um, so the land that I go on to is usually not my land, it's usually not reservation land, because most of the trees are cut. So I have to get permission from Crown Land, the government, Parks Canada, private woodlot owners, and there are times that they want to help, but other times they don't want to help. So it's always a challenge to explain to them that uh, this is a good thing, it's uh, valuable for our nation, our youth, but it's also valuable for the country and the world. So those challenges, um, and a lot of times the government will say, well, how much did you pay for the birch bark, or how much did you pay for spruce roots? So my challenge is I can't tell them, you know, I bought birch bark at Canadian Tire, I bought birch bark at Home Hardware, because it's not, you can't do that. And I have to go and harvest and dig my own roots. So those are challenges that that are, you know, I, I can't go to the store and order 700 feet of birch, uh, spruce root. So things like that. And also to uh, make the government realize that this is a good thing. This is very good for our community, our people, and our nation. And uh, so those were challenges. But after, you know, 20, 30 years... I have a lot of people willing to help me now because they do see the benefits of, of this. Tourism is a huge uh, part of what I do because uh, it's a very rare skill and uh, I usually do it in public so people can come and see. What to you is um, like a measure of success in your students? I guess for me it's even uh, sometimes a little hard to talk about, but it's a smile on the faces of the elders. What I can call success, when I can see an elder smiling and coming up to me and say, you're doing really well, you're doing good, you're doing good things. But also to have a five-year-old little boy come over and, and help me with this canoe and tell me when, when I get older, I want to build a canoe too, boys and girls. And that, you know, it's worth more than any money for me it's uh, very it, it really um, makes my heart feel good and also the the amount of people that these projects attract because I have hundreds of people coming from all over the world all over the province and country so uh, I have people come from Texas from Ottawa from and they'll tell me, we came here just to see this. And I'm really humbled by that, that they actually think that what my great-grandfather was born in 1874. He died in 1961. He didn't, he didn't have any electricity, but he raised my father because my father's father was died shortly after World War I. And um, so my great-grandfather raised my father 
and he also kept my father from attending residential school. Great grandfather would hide my father in the woods every time they came to get him. So I've taken that negative thing, you know, my, my, my grandfather, my father's father, shot himself, committed suicide because of World War I, of what it had happened. When he came back, he had one leg, he couldn't work. He was chased out of town because he was an Indian. When they buried him, they buried him outside the fence in the cemetery because he was an Indian. And bad, terrible stories and terrible negative things that had happened in the past. You know, I've taken this and, and this, this canoe has brought a lot of positive things. And it's because of the efforts of my grandfather and my great-grandfather and my father and, you know, my grandparents and uh, that I'm able to do what I do. The next questions are more about Indigenous education in general, but was there anything else you wanted to say about your program specifically? I would like to see the programs in schools, whether it be a training center, a uh, community college, a university. But I, I do know one thing is that I cannot do it alone. I, you know, I'm getting to the point where, I mean, I can go for another 10 years, but my hands are sore, I'm developing arthritis, but I have 30 to 40 years of knowledge that I need to pass on. So I really need help somehow to, to get people involved so I, can, um, so I can pass this on and somebody will take it. Because I, you know, there's going to be a day that I'm not going to be around, and I hate to see that 30 to 40 years of knowledge that I have, birch bark and, and things that I've been taught, I hate to see that lost. I want it to keep going. Do you ever work with the Craft College here in New Brunswick? Uh, no, I haven't. No, I haven't. I'm in on Vancouver Island right now. We're back in Nova Scotia, probably from. May to September, sometimes longer, but uh, this summer we're building two canoes. Next summer we're building a, an ocean canoe for the North American Indigenous Games, and uh, that's 21-foot ocean canoe. So I'm, I'm really, uh, as I said, I had over 20 requests, so I'm, I'm limited as to, you know, how, where I can go, and Possibly next spring I'll be in Newfoundland. Uh, so, so I, you know, there's a lot of uh, interest out there. And mostly what I have to do is for 2020, I have to harvest in 2019. So I have to harvest almost a year ahead. So that's what I try to do. And, and it's like one canoe, 16 feet, takes more than 700 feet of route. So... To have somebody to help me to split those roots and learn as they as they do that would be really good. Crafts College would be great. You know, community college uh, would be really nice to see. But do you ever work with the Red Road Project? Uh, very little. I did some presentations for them, uh, but they only asked me, I think, once... Uh, once they're at Stone Bear Lodge, and uh, that I never, never uh, heard from them anymore. From yeah. from your perspective, what is Indigenous education? Well, I, I say the door is wide open on that because uh, I grew up really not having it in school. In saying that, I never really had Indigenous education in school, and what I did have wasn't good; it was negative. So I think the door is wide open. And we can really develop something incredible. There's so much from the land, so much that we can do, but also modern stuff. Like right now, I'm, I'm carving red cedar because I'm here in British Columbia. I'm carving Mi'kmaq petroglyphs on three-foot diameter red cedar. So I'm taking an old tradition and modernizing it. So there's so many modern things we can do. You know, uh, it's endless. So, Indigenous education, I really think it needs to involve Indigenous people. There's so many elders out there with stories and knowledge they want to share. Unfortunately, sometimes 
in our First Nations governments, because of First Nations politics, a lot of these elders aren't on their on their lists and they get missed. You know, so in some communities, there are elders who don't have chance to to take part in different things because, you know, and sometimes maybe it's because of politics. So that that's unfortunate because our youth lose there, and uh, we all lose there because there's still elders out there who have something to give and are being missed. So I think, you know, that's that's very important not to miss those elders because once an elder passes, you know, that book is closed. For the future, like, what is your vision for Indigenous education for the next 10 years? Like, what would you like to see? Well, for me, I will continue to do what I do as long as I can. Always, uh, you know, as I said over the years, I can build a canoe or I can do work in my shop with the doors closed. But nobody benefits from that. I have to pass on things, so I always have to be involved with teaching. And uh, so I'd like to see uh, it continued. I'd like to see schools where people are taught how to make baskets. People are taught, you know, you know how to how to skin deer, uh, how to tan a hide, how to make drums. For example, I'll I'll have leftover pieces of birch bark. I'll have leftover pieces of spruce root, but I can't throw it away because what what I can't use on a canoe can be used somewhere else. It can be used for making little containers. Mm. I can do etchings on the winter bark, and it can be a a two-inch square piece of winter bark. It's so much that can be done with that. Uh, the uh, Abbey Museum in Bar Harbor, Maine. Incredible work. And the youth in Maine are creating incredible things. You know, baskets, uh, birch bark. Uh, it's really uh, inspiring to see that. I would like to see maybe certain centers in certain areas where, where you can set up and people can come and learn. And I'll be teaching, physically I'll be teaching, you know, at least for another 10 years, but verbally I can still, I want to do a book, I would like to do videos, but I would love to do a book of, of my knowledge because I have knowledge that some people, well, because I've worked with Birch Park for most of my life, I do have knowledge that many people don't have. And I really think once you gain the knowledge, you have a responsibility. In our, our culture, my responsibility is to pass it on. So that's what I hope to do. What do you think makes an amazing, uh, like the Indigenous program, amazing or effective? Well, you have to get people involved that have the passion. You know, it can be, it's really nice to work with indigenous people, but there are non-indigenous people that uh, can help as well. But I think it needs to be indigenous run. You know, we have to have, uh, we have to have, uh, you know, criteria that, that makes it successful, but it really needs to be run by indigenous people. And not always do they have to be, uh, university educated because you know I, I did spend three and a half years in teachers college and I'm a licensed carpenter but my qualifications are written on birch bark you know and and I I can't go to university and learn anywhere what I know but you know I can teach it but uh, I would like to be able to uh, to do that well, that's it for the questions here, but was there anything else that you wanted to add or say? I'm sort of doing similar to what, what this program is. I've sort of been doing it doing it all along. Uh, sometimes sometimes uh, people have incredible ideas, but they're, they're traveling parallel. It's like train tracks. You go side by side doing the same thing, and sometimes they never, never touch. So I think the, if we can come together and, and help each other, it'll become stronger.